The United Nations estimates that fisheries and aquaculture provide livelihoods to around 820 million people worldwide. Fish is one of the most highly traded food commodities globally. The UN also reports that the percentage of stocks fished at biologically unsustainable levels has increased from 10% in 1974 to 34% in 2017. Climate change has fish on the move, creating an uncertain future for millions of people who depend on fish for protein and jobs. We need to transition to sustainable fishing and aquaculture that benefit people and the ocean alike. Welcome back, everyone. I hope everyone's uh, gotten a dose of caffeine and is ready to lean back in for another productive session. Uh, this morning, we've already covered quite a range of uh, topics and uh, heard some amazing speakers and listened to some beautiful performances. Um, in fact, uh, it wasn't long ago that uh, I was at uh, Mia's father's house, a very dear friend of mine, um, having kava and listening to two little girls rehearse on their guitars and fast forward through the pandemic to today and we can see that Mia has become such an amazing talent and I think uh, Taholo, we can, uh, we can all say that we're now fans and we're looking forward to seeing what she does in the future. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm thrilled to introduce uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Fiorenza Micheli. Amongst other roles, she's the co-director of the Stanford Center for Ocean Solutions. Dr. Michele has led a huge diversity of research from small-scale fisheries sustainability to the impacts of ocean acidification on marine species. Uh, this work has taken her all over the world, from the Mediterranean Sea to the Chagos Archipelago and here to Palau. Dr. Michele, welcome. Good morning, everyone. Ali, uh, what an amazing, inspiring uh, opening of uh, our ocean. Uh, it's re really a great honor to be here and to introduce and moderate uh, the next panel, which will focus on advancing sustainable fisheries. Uh, so it is my great pleasure to introduce the speaker, Anne Singio, Inda Ruffiati, Jennifer Dianto Kemmerly, <laughs> Shaq Sheriff, and Rocky Sanchez Tirona. So over the past two years, uh, uh, growing attention to blue foods has been a powerful reminder, reminder for all of us that the sustainable production of food from the sea is not only important to healthy oceans, but also to human health, nutrition, livelihood, economies, justice, and most of the sustainable development goals in addition to SDG 14. Blue foods are central to healthy, sustainable, and equitable food systems. However, up to now, fisheries have not been at the center of the food agenda and action. And this is particularly true for the small-scale sectors, small-scale actors that have been especially uh, neglected. 
small scale actors are uh, tremendously important uh, in providing uh, nutrition and livelihood uh, all over the world. Uh, they employ 90% of the men and women in the fisheries and aquaculture sector, which supply chains uh, uh, offer jobs for over 800 million people, as we, uh, as we heard. They produce over half of the catch uh, and over two thirds of what is consumed uh, uh, by people around the world. And if managed well, they have great potential to uh, have low environmental footprint while at the same time providing for livelihood, nutrition, and advancing the inclusion of women and indigenous communities' rights. However, small scale fisheries are facing a range of threats and challenges. Uh, resources are overexploited, habitats are degraded, heat waves have disrupted production, and then the pandemic has disrupted the supply chain. And often, uh, uh, the small-scale small -scale actors don't have access to the resources that are needed and don't have a voice in governance and decision making. And this is particularly true for indigenous communities and women in too many parts of the world still. And also, uh, there's also limited data on small-scale fisheries, and this makes effective management very difficult. So going forward, um, there is an imperative uh, to uh, have initiatives and action that is focus on advancing sustainable fisheries and a vibrant small-scale sector uh, within that. Uh, this is particularly urgent for um, island, states around, uh, island states, which are extraordinarily reliant on ocean and ocean resources, uh, and also have an important role in leading action in conservation and ocean sustainability, and have strong connection with ocean resources, as we heard from panelists and, uh, and speakers before us. Uh, so going forward, there's an opportunity to, and a need really to support uh, uh, initiatives and partnerships that uh, uh, are focused on supporting ocean conservation um, uh, around the, uh, uh, around the, uh, across island nations to achieve the, the linked goals of biodiversity conservation, but also human health, livelihood, and also equity and, uh, uh, and justice as well as food and nutrition. So it is my uh, absolute pleasure to introduce uh, our speakers today. Um, they, um, they each will highlight uh, the challenges, opportunities, and solutions for, for uh, advancing a sustainable fisheries sector. And uh, I'm uh, very pleased to call to the stage our first speakers, uh, Anne Singio, who's executive director of a Bill Society uh, here in Palau, and the floor is yours. Malung il tutao. Silang. In tutan mo ra rubul belao, sil belao ng atyang president tra belao. Omi rubul ader belao mas omi lo mertyang yung rubul mga aktyal sil sil bago ng abu. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Anne Singeo from a local NGO located in the northern reefs of Palau. Today I'll be telling you a story about women fishers of Palau. And the, the story is not unusual to the rest of the Pacific Island region. Palau women fishery is an old tradition of gathering and gleaning invertebrates in mangroves and shallow areas of seagrass. The traditional uh, this is a traditional fishery similar to those in other Pacific islands uh, where women would gather at low tides uh, to share food, stories, and bring home enough to feed their families. Today, Palauan women dominate the informal market by 75%, with 32% relying on their sales as primary source of income. But this fishery faces threats of serial depletion and potential elimination. This is the result of inequity in support and development for women fishers with limited management and protection for sustainability based on the assumption that fishery only belongs to men. 
The sea cucumber fishery faces, faced its most devastating impact from the seafood trade in 2011, when 88% of the wild stock was depleted. Male fishers were the dominant beneficiaries of this trade, as women lacked the motor boats or ability to harvest at the rate demanded, demanded of the trade. But in the end, women fishers pay the price, as their fishery is depleted 88% and to this day has not recovered. Working with women fishers uh, and through the support of our friends from the Canadian government and Taiwan government, we work with women fishers and hatchery technicians at Palau Bureau of Fisheries, and we've initiated a sea cucumber restoration project. And at one treatment site, we've increased the wild stock from five individual species of sea cucumber to 540 individual species in an area 1,700 square meters in six months. A small sign of hope for the women fishers that someday their fishery just might be restored. Ladies and gentlemen, we must commit to restoring and protecting seagrass meadows of the world. One of the world's largest carbon sinker able to store 10% of the world's carbon faster than a tropical forest, and allow important women and girls fisheries to thrive, old traditions to thrive, and this iconic endangered species like the Palawan dugong to survive, and increase our island nation's ability to recover from the damaging impact of climate change. Because from this end of the community, the struggle has never been about money, but it's about ancient traditions, knowledge, passing it on to the next generation, making sure that we have fish on the table for our families. It is about the sacredness of the ocean. It is about balance. So I ask you, if you're going to do something about this today, do it for equity. Do it for social justice. Do it for environmental justice. Do it for us. Thank you. Omar Misula. Thank you, Anne. The next speaker is Inda Ruffiati, whose fisheries lead at PCC Lestari and Blue Ventures. Good morning, everyone. It's a great opportunity to be here. Growing, as a child growing up in Java, one of the biggest islands in Indonesia, I used to love reading about the adventures of the famous five of Enid Blyton's books. Living in a country that has more than 17,000 islands, I was particularly drawn of the stories of them visiting islands and dream of a life of island hopping discovery like theirs. The sea makes up 70% of my country, yet when I was growing up, the attention was mostly towards the land rather than the sea. But I wanted to find a way to help my country understand our blue treasures and why we must protect it. So I decided to study marine and fishery science. It was not a popular subject, especially for female students. And people often ask why I was doing this, and if I wanted to be a fish seller, because this route might not lead to good jobs like studying medicine, law, or economics. My first adventure came at university with a research expedition with students from Japan. It was my first experience meeting global family lovers, global ocean lovers, and it was also my first time in overcoming fear. There was a place above the sail, it was so high. We were all scared to climb up, but the professor encouraged us to go up. 
telling us that we must be serious about the sea because it's beautiful, mysterious, and will teach us so many things. So I climb it. When I go up, I remember feeling that I was no longer afraid of anything and that I could achieve anything that I want. After graduating, I joined a research trip in Maluku in a small island called Haruku. One week before we were due to leave, my friend told me that he could no longer go. I wondered whether a girl from Java could go and do this work alone. I felt the fear, but I did it anyway. I went quickly from being a stranger to being part of the community that treats me like family and now sings a song to me every time I go back to the island. In 2018, I worked with Blue Ventures, an NGO that supports community-led fisheries management and conservation. We empower the communities to collect data on fisheries and using the data for them to manage the natural resources so that it will be sustainable for generations to come. Climate change affects fisheries. It changes fish behavior. Increasing sea temperature stress critical habitat like coral reefs. But I believe that the communities have the solutions. Participatory monitoring, where the communities collect the data on habitat, on their fishing activities, their income, empowers the community to engage in observing the trend and change in their fisheries and using the data to make informed decisions for fisheries management. I'm also an artist and the sea inspires my paintings. As you can see, this is my paintings and I'm never far away from the sea. At the moment, I also support communities in Philippines and Papua New Guinea because I want to be a leader beyond my country. I want to inspire more girls and women to learn about marine biology, fisheries, and conservation because we know we can do it and we can do it better. <laughs> Across 17,000 islands of my country and far, far beyond, we need to make gender split more balanced because now it is mostly male voices. We need more girls and women to join the fight for marine protection. And I'm grateful that today I joined another dot in Palau to meet another extremely important ocean lovers community because together we can make conservation back home to the people who need it the most. Thank you. Thank you so much, Inda. Next is Jennifer Dianto Kemerly, who's Vice President of Global Ocean Initiatives at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Thank you, Theo. Theo and I are neighbors. We are not too far away. I'm Jen. I'm from Monterey Bay Aquarium in California. And Monterey Bay Aquarium, for 20 years, has had a program called Seafood Watch. And we've been encouraging the development of a sustainable seafood movement throughout the United States and working with other colleagues throughout Europe and Japan, trying to create a drumbeat for businesses to make very public-facing commitments to source only from environmentally responsible and socially responsible fisheries and aquaculture. Now, how do we guide businesses on this journey? We have to rate the environmental and management performance of fisheries and aquaculture to help advise them along the way. The same information has been very informative for governments and industry to help identify where improvements can be made. So what I'm gonna to do to, with you today is I'm gonna show you how we're doing with environmental performance according to our standard. However, I really wanna to speak to some unique challenges that we're finding, especially among those seafood commodity groups where the vast majority of production is from small-scale fisher and farmers, not industrialized or developed countries. So what you see right here is a chart of how much certifications and ratings programs globally, how much we've assessed. And of the 40% of global production that we've assessed against our environmentally-based stand standards, you'll see that about 25% is green rated, highest level of performance. A big shout out to our kelp um, innovators here because half of that is kelp, seaweed. 
5% eco-certified, 2% in the yellow, there are some concerns, about 9% red. That means there are significant environmental concerns or management concerns. We're going to come back to that in a minute because that's where I want to talk to you a little bit about how partnership projects has really helped us accelerate change at scale. But I also want to point out there's a lot of gray. There's a lot of gray there that means we haven't assessed it yet. And we're predicting that a lot of that in the gray is due to a lack of available data for us to even understand the status of those fisheries and aquaculture operations. So that's also an important limiting factor that we want to be aware of. But let's talk a little bit about some projects that we started actually three years ago at this very conference. We launched um, a project with the Philippines to work on the blue swimming crab fishery in the Visayan Sea. Why? because the vast majority of that blue swimming crab was coming into the U.S. market. And it was, for that particular fishery, over 8,000 small fishers who had to come together and design improvements with the goal of improving stock assessment, collecting basic data, understanding how the fishing gear, the gill nets and the pots or traps, were impacting other species. We had to also work with governments to understand how we were going to build capacity with the local governance units so they could even begin to collect data. And we had to work with a diversity of supply chain actors to understand what voluntary measures could be done to help accelerate some improvements. So how do we do this? Well, co-design. It really was getting everyone at the table at the onset. And I'll speak to this more in a few more minutes. But I want to tell you that in just three years, we were able to do this. We were able to pull together the relevant partners, and now there is a science-based stock assessment. There is a research study that's informing better management on bycatch. There are GPS tracking pilots in place right now monitoring fishing activity, and the supply chain actors have voluntary measures to better regulate the fishery. And right now, the government of the Philippines has a new crab management plan that sets a very clear expectation that social equity has to be baked in to projects and ordinances at the onset, not as an afterthought. All the quotes that you're going to see in my slides today are from the project partners on the ground. They're not from me, they're not from some NGO, they're not from the business sector. They're from the local fishers and farmers who understand the challenges of bringing back all these stakeholder groups together. Okay. So this model of bringing together at the beginning the fishers or fish farmers, the local governments, the national governments, and the supply chain actors, this is not a new model. This is stakeholder engagement 101, if you will. And this is another project that we've done in the aquaculture sector that really showed us the innovation, the opportunity here. Because a few years ago at another ocean conference, um, a company in Vietnam that farms a lot of shrimp named Min Phu, they made a commitment to improve 20,000 of their shrimp farms to come out of the red rating and into the green and the yellow. Again, how are we going to do this? 20,000 shrimp farms. So they work very quickly with pulling together local stakeholders, building capacity with the supply chain actors, getting the government involved, working with local community, community groups and fishers and civil society. All these groups had to come together at the table. But there is one piece that's consistent between the Philippines example and this one, and that it's we have to leverage innovation and partnership to make collecting data easier and we have to get all the right players at the table and when they're at the table they need to articulate the value they need to see to stay engaged. So I think there's promise for you and what we can achieve together. <laughs> Thank you so much. Jennifer, sorry. Thank you very much. So I'm very happy to introduce the next speaker, Shaq Sheriff from the National Fisheries and Aquaculture Authority in Liberia. Thank, Thank you, you very Shaq. much. Ali, Ali, um, good morning. Hello, everybody. Um, fisheries management ensure the integrity of the marine environment and the livelihood that depend on them remain stable. My name is Sheikh Sharif. I'm from Liberia, a small West African state that has been living effective fisheries management for the past seven to 10 years. 
Well, am I, I'm going to be talking a bit about um, my experience with the West Africa Fisheries Project and data collected over the years from the 10 or uh, nine participating countries. Um, you, we all know that uh, over 80 million tons of uh, uh, over uh, 80 million tons of fish is being harvested annually, and 33% of those are overfished, and 67% uh, are overexploited. Now, uh, Mauritanian, sorry, that's the French uh, spelling for Mauritanian. If you see the, uh, the, the uh, chart out here, the, there is a variability between the declared and estimated Irish, which is around 30, 13,000 tons. And the 13,000 tons, if you look at the average of the industrial demercial trawl cash estimates, that average, I mean, versus what has been declared by these vessels fishing, I mean, comes up to around 13,000 tons. And that is a serious variability and the disparity when it comes to um, the fisheries. Now, Liberia has been leading um, sustainable fisheries management and uh, looking at the number of industrial trawlers lessons in 2017, which has been reduced now to six, there has been an issue about the stringent measures that have been put in place, policy regulations, legislative framework, especially when it comes to eliminating or reducing IUU fishing activities. Now, due to um, the, the effective management region of, or, or, of Liberia, um, there has been some inconsistency, especially when it comes to other countries, for example, Ghana. Ghana has been spending around 200 million each year to show up for um, um, uh, importation of, um, of fish. Um, because IU fishing has also eliminated um, on most of the fish sources. Ten years ago, the Ghanaian fishermen and the Ghanaian fisheries was quite more effective, was quite more prosperous. Um, but unfortunately, now the Ghanaian president and uh, the presidency um, uh, or the members of parliament have been showing up 200 million plus to ensure that they close up the gap for um, uh, ensuring that the importation of fish to um, uh, ascertain the fisheries needs or the protein needs for the country. Um, now, there, for the West African sub-region, um, there are several trawlers that are actually um, employed into the system. Um, these trawlers are lessened through a kind of a revised licensing regime for which of the, each of the country. These uh, regimes are completely different from one country to the other. From the West Africa Fisheries uh, Project um, or experience, Liberia has, um, um, from the uh, beginning of the project, for example, in 2010, 2011, um, a moratorium was put on the fisheries, which gave three months to draft a new fisheries legislation that would give provisions, new licensing conditions for effective monitoring, control, and surveillance. And that led to the establishment of the Fisheries Monitoring Center um, uh, versus monitoring application system with mobile transceiver units on licensed vessels, automated identification system, and other forms of uh, uh, ocean viewing software. Unfortunately, most countries in the region are not going to be funding data collection or MCS enforcement. It's for a simple reason. Most of the agents for these foreign vessels or foreign trawlers are members of parliaments, which is a huge influence, especially when it comes to pocketing money for the fisheries. So these are the different types of trawlers, the stern trawlers, which are the back trawlers, or these um, side trawlers that are employed into the fisheries. It is not about them being employed into the fisheries, how many of them, and whether they are legal, yes, of course, but they are unreported and unregulated. When we say a fisheries is being overfished or something illegally has been done, which means that you have um, an, um, a regulation that is related to a fishing um, or a fishery um, that has been violated. Now, um, this is just a very uh, a, a snapshot about um, the different types of vessels. The percentage there are vessels that are from uh, that are Asian origin, water from South Korea, water from China. So there are huge presence of the Asian vessels, the distant, distant water fleets. You have industrial tuna vessels that are part of in the region. You have 67 tuna personers, 85 long liners, and 26 pool in line. Now, evidence of overfishing. Um, this is the situation with the activities of these trawlers. There's always a situation that over half of the fisheries that are put on these uh, vessels are returned back to sea. And what happens when you return these unsustainable practices or non-selective fish species or juvenile species back to sea? 
they create aposia or agnostic conditions that reduces the um, dissolved oxygen level in these waters that affects the um, fisheries generally, the biological side, so sometimes it enables them or ha have them leaving from one place to the other. So um, I'm going to skip. Um, so this is um, um, the white in the bracket, and those are the number of canoes, and you have the yellow in the, um, the different maps. Those are the number of production. So artisanal estimates is approximately um, 960,000 tons, and that is, uh, I mean, for the last couple of years uh, from experience with the project. Now, how Liberia has made this work? I mean, principal um, fishing effort not to exceed available fish stocks. So Liberia has been very successful in making this happen. I mean, they were able to generate around $6.3 million from illegal fishing I mean, of different kinds. And uh, now what they are principally set on your annual lesson fee, you have to determine or estimate that, and you are going to be paying 10% upfront of that. And when you bring your catch to a show, maybe that has been validated or verified by fishery observer or fishery inspectors, I mean, now the difference is going to be paid. Um, uh, I will stop here for now. My time is over, and I thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. This is the last uh, speaker. And uh, OK, the last speaker in this panel, no, 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 you can, uh, is Rocky Sanchez Tirona, who is the managing director of Fish Forever, everywhere. Thank you, Rocky. Hello, good morning, everyone. Ali. Uh, I have to warn you, this is the first audience I'm facing outside of a Zoom screen in two years. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm here to talk about fish, um, um, sustainable fisheries in the context of 30 by 30. So uh, in response to the global biodiversity crisis, the UN Convention on Biodiversity um, has really called for the protection of land and sea, 30% of it, um, uh, by 2030. And, and we know, many of us here in the room today, um, national governments, international organizations, support this call because we, we know that this is important and, and we're all getting behind a very ambitious goal. Um, but how do we make sure that as we implement 30 by 30, we are actually getting the greatest impact for people and nature? So we're here making commitments for the ocean. We know that a healthy ocean is actually going to be critical for food, for livelihoods, and for the ability of communities to adapt to climate change. And we know also that many of these communities are the least responsible for climate change in the first place. And so, um, as we think about how to execute on 30 by 30, I think it's very important for us to make sure that we're also fo focusing our attention on the area of the ocean that has the greatest impact on people. And this is the territorial seas. Territorial seas are 0 to 12 nautical miles. Thin band of ocean just makes up 6% of the ocean, but actually home to 70% of its biodiversity. At the same time, this is where we see 100% of mangroves, of seagrass, kelp forests, and 83% of coral reefs. So, so much of the beauty and the, and, and the wonder that we saw earlier are really found in territorial waters. At the same time, Territorial waters are really where the intersection of biodiversity and high human, need, high human need is, right? There are 60 million people that work in small scale fisheries. Many of these are found in coastal waters. Another 53 million depend on um, small scale fisheries for, for um, subsistence. And then this, this actually makes up 40% um, of the global catch. And almost all of this catch is, is for food. So, so that's really how important this area is. But the thing is, territorial waters are actually under, um, underprotected. They're overlooked and underprotected. Only 11% of, 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 of protected marine areas are found in tropical territorial waters. Most of the others are outside, far from the biodiversity-rich areas that we're talking about. It's, it's really because it's, easily, it's easier to set up a marine protected area far from densely populated areas, right? Um, it's socially and politically easier and more feasible. But that we can't keep, allow that, that disparity to, to continue if we really want to make an impact uh, in, in the lives of people. If we want 30 by 30 to make an impact um, on, on, on not just nature, but people, we need to address this issue. So we think that there's 
ways that we can do this. Um, there's a lot of uh, a lot of success has already happened. Um, groups like Blue Ventures and and NGO and and our us at Rare. This, these are the pillars of our approach. The first one is really about pairing uh, protection with effective management. So in areas in ter territorial waters, it's very hard to actually um, declare all no-take zones, right? So so it can't be all off limits, but if you have protected areas that uh, are off limits to fishing, and then they're surrounded by areas where it's managed and fishing is done sustainably, you actually can make sure that it's the communities and the indigenous community and the indigenous fishers that are around that area that benefit from the conservation. This video shows a, a community in Mozambique uh, where they established their first community managed and uh, managed access and reserve area um, and set up the buoys. And as you can see from their action, we're pretty sure they're going to be able to, to make this work. Um, and then another piece is really bigger is not always better. Uh, sometimes smaller uh, networks of smaller reserves put together can actually yield better results and they're actually more acceptable for the community. Um, if you do it properly with the right uh, data, you can actually get um, fish, fish recover, recovery for your populations. And then lastly, we have to elevate the roles of communities and local governments in this, in this story. We have to devolve the authority to, to, to these communities because they're scattered all over. There are hundreds and thousands of them. So we need to be able to give them the authority, the tools, and the data so that they can actually do good decision making. So finally, thank you very much. This is, as we push towards 30 by 30, we need to make a concerted effort to really focus some of the funding that we have towards these very important waters, the territorial waters. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for your really informative and inspiring presentations. We have a few minutes for some follow-up questions, and so we can add to your remarks. Uh, COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic has been this global shock that has affected everyone. Uh, how has, been, has it affected uh, uh, small-scale fishers and fishing communities specifically, Anne? And we'll, we'll start with questions with Anne. Thank you, Theo. Um, uh, together with uh, um, other organizations around the world, we launched a study on 199 coastal communities across the Pacific who were impacted by, uh, practiced small-scale fisheries and impacted by uh, the pandemic. And uh, this, some of the, the, the most um, highlighted uh, results of that study shows that the communities who were less uh, reliant on uh, uh, store-bought uh, food were uh, most vulnerable. Um, but the communities who relied on their oceans and, and uh, traditional food systems uh, um, were more resilient. But one of the most beautiful outcome of that study showed how important traditional food systems of food sharing, of giving food to the vulnerable populations in your community goes a long way and became the most practiced uh, um, part of our culture across all of those 199 coastal communities of the Pacific. And I think that uh, brings forth a very important uh, um, concept and should be a recommended solutions at looking at those traditional food systems, reviving them um, if we are going to be um, have food sovereignty and be secured in our, uh, in our way of life in the Pacific. Thank you. Thank you, and a great, no, a rich opportunity, specifically here in the Pacific, with the diversity of culture and tradition and mm -hmm. resources. Yes. Uh, Inda, how can governments best support uh, uh, management of natural resources by communities at local scales? Thank you, for, experience. thank you for the question. I can give you an example from Indonesia. So in Maluku, there is a system called SASI. So SASI is a set of customary laws to manage natural resource. And it has been practiced by the communities for centuries. 
and the government has a legal framework which recognizes the rights of the customary communities to manage their natural resources. So combining governmental policy with customary laws empowers community and also will support more effective natural resources management. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jennifer, in your remarks, you have highlighted the need and opportunity to promote sustainability across entire supply chains. Uh, so my question is, what, uh, uh, what are some obstacles, perhaps, or some challenges that might prevent this improvement? Yeah. yeah, I mean, with the partnership approach in general, if there's not a persistent market demand and expectation for sustainability, I feel like the whole thing could just collapse like a house of cards. That has to be there. And to really sustain engagement, if all of the stakeholders are not getting some sort of value from the partnership, that also could undermine progress or just make it be a blip on the screen and not something that continues in perpetuity. And that value has to go all the way back down to the small scale fisher or farmer and the capacity building has to happen at that local government level and with the supply chain. That's a critical piece. But now if we blow this up to sustainability with fisheries and aquaculture in general, if we do not address issues like IUU, if we do not create climate resilient oceans and fisheries, if in the aquaculture sector we aren't paying attention to antibiotic use as that sector grows rapidly, we're setting us up for real big problems at a grand scale. So today's panel was really about what we can do with local fishing communities and projects, but we also have to look holistically and tackle all of this at once. That will have to require partnerships, partnerships, partnerships. We've heard the buzz term, get out of our silos work across agencies. I'm so pleased to see so many different agency groups within governments here today and the private sector and philanthropy because it's going to take all of us to do this together. Thank you, Fio. Thank you so much. Uh, Sheik, uh, this is an opportunity to <laughs> expand <laughs> on the, exactly. I'm sorry I had to cut you <laughs> short, but um, <laughs> what has been the role of Liberia in promoting more effective fisheries management in the West African region? Uh, well, I mean, the first of all was the banning of industrial trawlers. Um, uh, uh, when the Liberia got the first uh, support from the World Bank um, uh, through the Jeff and IDA, um, uh, they had a moratorium put on the fisheries in that ensure that they had a red legal framework in place, for example, of fisheries or regulations uh, and the drive art that will uh, have provisions for licensing, but also for fisheries enforcement when it comes to monitoring, control, and surveillance. And uh, because Liberia, since the 50s, 1950s, I mean, there was this uh, natural resource law that governed the fisheries and other marine uh, protected areas and resources. So the project intervention um, uh, created a space to have uh, this drafted. And, uh, um, and next to that was the establishment of the State of Height uh, Fisheries Monitoring Center that had ocean viewing softwares, for example, the vessel monitoring system that uh, um, also a condition for licensing for these vessels before you are given a license, besides the, ins the inspections and, and the rest of the, the list, the standard operating procedures, you should have a vessel monitoring uh, a system on the vessel. And to do that, you should have something you call the mobile transceiver unit that will have uh, the fisheries monitoring center staff to get access to the vessel, the movement, so it tells the staff what the vessel is doing, whether it's bunkering, whether it's transshipment at sea, and transshipment at sea under the laws of Liberia is uh, um, illegal. You have to come back to put, declare your, your, um, your catch and you seek approval. And another thing is, um, also, the center has an automated identification system. It's a kind of a, a cool satellite technology, also like the VMS, but that uh, provide access to vessel locations, identity, and other specifications of, for vessels above 299 or gross tonnage. But uh, most interestingly, what Liberia did, which is different from the rest of the country in the region, is the establishment of the Monitoring Control and Surveillance Coordination Center. And that center makes provision for all relevant stakeholders in the maritime domain to have what you call a kind of an MOU for that space. Fisheries management, it is not about um, the institutions, about the fish, or the fish there. The fish can take care of themselves. They have been doing that for millions of years. It's the people. <laughs> How to manage the people that fish. 
So the MOU provides the right to the lead institutions to sign the head of these institutions to commit. But then in addition to that, there is the most interesting part to have an administrative and operational framework that will identify rules and responsibilities of all of the relevant players so that there shouldn't be any overlap of functions or conflict, which is very, very essential because when you are going out at sea for fisheries boarding or enforcement, you have something you call a boarding party. Fisheries take the lead, of course, but you have people from Maritime, the Coast Guard, because only the laws of Liberia, only the Liberian Coast Guard can enforce. So all of the stakeholders, when you bring the vessel back, then fisheries will work with the Ministry of Justice to say, okay, yeah, these are according to or consistent with the regulation, then, this, then the Justice Ministry take it. So the National Port Authority, Library Immigration Services, I mean, because different nationalities, so it's a whole range of different things. But Liberia got, uh, you know, Liberia um, was able to generate over $6.3 million from illegal fishing between 2011 and 2013. I mean, for a whole lot of different funds, but fishing with the wrong gears and the rest of it, and uh, fishing with the fortune essences. And uh, that was mainly because um, the country enforced or cis nautical my issue exclusion zone, zone exclusively for artisanal or small scale fishers. So that zone, industrial vessels uh, are not allowed. So there are so much to say that I didn't say in my presentation, but I mean, I will stop here for now and thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> and Rocky, you concluded your remarks uh, with a call to action, elevating the role of communities and governments at local scale. What does success look like? What does this look like on the ground when, it's, when it works? Right, so I think when we're able to give communities and local governments the, the right information and knowledge, um, and we're able to bring both um, marine and, and social science to a, to a place where they can actually use it and adapt it to their own context, and then they make their, their own decisions and, and really adaptively manage it as, as the conditions need. They get really good at even tapping resources from, from national government agencies. They're able to, to, to understand what they need each year and, and then build that in. So, so I think over time, they really own it and, and that really becomes, uh, you know, that it, they make sure that it succeeds and it works and it's theirs and we can get out and, and yeah. So uh, please join me in a round of applause in thanking the speakers on this panel. The panel highlighted uh, uh, the need to promote ocean conservation and the conservation of coastal and ocean resources, and at the same time also strengthen capabilities, nurture the, the diversity, uh, build resilience, and put people first, really, people and ocean always together as a system.